Hi guys, I'm one of the PLAs for Dr. Armstrong. I'm in his 910 class, and so I just thought I'd quickly go through and um, do a answer key video for some of the harder problems off this practice test from last year. Um, but if you all have any questions or anything, feel free to email me. My email is for nyb46341 at uga.edu. I also have office hours on Mondays um, from 4 to 6 p.m. in the same room that Dr. Armstrong does his office hours. But hopefully this video will help clear up any confusion on some of the more difficult questions in um, last year's test. All right, number nine. Um, in tomato plants, fruit acidity is determined by four genes that each dip display incomplete dominance. Um, each copy of a dominant allele makes the fruit more acidic. If you cross two medium acidity plants with the genotypes uh, big A, little a, little a, little b, little b, big C, little c, big D, little d, um, and little a, little a, big B, little b, big C, little c, big D, little d, what is the likelihood of an offspring displaying the lowest possible acidity? So let's write out the genotype for a plant with the lowest possible acidity. Um, that would be all lowercase letters, right? Because a dominant allele makes the fruit more acidic. So we would have little a, little a, little b, little b, little c, little c, little d, little d. That's our ideal genotype. That's the one we're looking for. Um, and the way to do this is to find all of the individual probabilities that the offspring will inherit one of the alleles and multiply them together, right? Because we're using the law of multiplication since um, the offspring needs to have little a, little a, and little b, little b, and little c, little c, and little d, little d. So let's just start off with a. Let's do that cross right there. So we know parent one has this and parent two has this. So... This is the Punnett square we're getting. And it looks like half of the offspring um, will have the little a, little a. Um, let's move on to B. So we know that parent one has this and parent two has this. And again, 50% of the offspring are going to be little b, little b. Moving on to C, so we know both parents are heterozygotes for C. So we have this as our little pun square. And it looks like 25% or one fourth of the offspring are going to be little c, little c, or are going to inherit the little c, little c. Now for D, again, two heterozygotes. So it's technically the same pun square, but we'll write it out again because why not? And yep, sure enough, one fourth of the offspring are gonna inherit, inherit um, little d, little d. So we've got one half times one half times one fourth times one fourth. Multiply that together, and we get one over sixty four, which is our answer right over here. Okay, number ten. If a woman is red green colorblind, an X linked recessive trait. What is the probability that her daughter will also be red, green, colorblind? So remember, females are XX and males are XY. So because the woman um, is red, green, colorblind, we know that she has this genotype because both of her X chromosomes need to have that trait since it is recessive. And her daughter, what's the probability that she will be red, green, colorblind? Um, in order for her daughter to be red, green, colorblind, she also needs to be XCXC. Um, and so we know this is one of the X chromosomes that a daughter will have because mom will give one of them, but we don't know the dad's genotype. So the dad could either be this or he could be this. We don't know whether dad is colorblind or not. Therefore, we can't know what the daughter's genotype would be because if the dad is colorblind, then she would be. But if the dad is not colorblind, she would just be a carrier. So the answer to this one would actually be unknown. Um, I'm just going to go a step further and explain a different, like another scenario. So let's say the um, question was actually asking us, what is the probability that the son will be colorblind? So we know the mom, again, XC, XC. And because um, males are always XY, 
they will always inherit their Y chromosome from dad and their X chromosome from mom. Mom has two um, X chromosomes that have that trait. So no matter what, the son will be colorblind. So if this question asked what is the probability that the son will be red, green, colorblind, it would be 100% the son will be colorblind. Okay, number 11 um, is also slightly challenging, requires a little bit more thought, so let's go over that one. Um, you cross a big A, big A, big B, big B, and little A, little A, little B, little B fruit flies to produce uh, big A, little A, big B, little B offspring. Um, when you cross these offspring with another little A, little B, little B, little B fly, the next generation is 51% big A, little A, little B, little B, 49% little A, little A, big B, little B. Oh my gosh, that's like a tongue twister. Um, what can you conclude about the genes A and B? So let's, I like to start off these problems by first determining what all of the possible um, outcomes can be for the offspring. So looking at those two genotypes, we're crossing um, this with this. All of the, we could do a punt square to figure it out. Um, you don't need to, but you can. Um, so I'll do that real quick for the individual alleles. And it looks like with each allele, there's only two possible um, genotypes. So you could either have big A, little A, or little A, little A, or big B, little B, little B, little B, which means all of the offspring either have to be big A, little A, little B, little B, or big A, little A, big B, little B, or little A, little A, little B, little B, little A, little A, big B, little B. These are all of the possible outcomes for the offspring. However, it looks like in reality, we got this outcome. So half of them were big A, little A, little B, little B, and half of them were little A, little A, big B, little B. So because of this, um, we know that there has to be something going on, um, that being that the genes are not sorting independently. So independent assortment, if we remember Mendel's law of independent assortment, um, it states that the alleles of two or more genes, um, different genes get sorted into gametes independently of one another, um, which means that all of these have an equal probability, basically. Um, however, we are not getting that. Um, instead, we're getting a 50-50 split with these two missing. Um, so right off the bat, we can say that this is our answer over here. Um, and the reason it's not these three, I'll just, you know, it's not this one because they they do not assort independently um, because we're not getting all four of the possible genotypes. Um, but the reason we know it's not B um, is, or C or D for that matter is because we haven't been given any information about the phenotypes of the flies. We only know their genotypes. So we really can't say whether they're affecting different traits, um, whether they're affecting each other, etc. So we can cross all of these out. All right, so number 14 is a fun one if you like um, doing these maps. So recombination rates for five genes, A through E, are located on the same chromosome as shown above. What is the expected distance between genes B and D? So anytime you're looking for expected distance, um, always start out by just building the gene map. Um, so let's draw a little, little line here, or actually I'll do it off to the side, um, just so we have more room. So I always start out by finding the two um, genes that have the greatest distance. So if we look through here, um, A through E has the largest distance um, because it, ha it's, it has a 29% recombination rates. So you know that those are the two ends of that chromosome. Um, then I work from one end. So let's start with E. And let's find which gene has the shortest distance from E. So we go through the list real quick. And it looks like D is located the shortest distance from E um, with 6% recombination. So we'll put D right here. Oh, and we'll, we'll put out these, um, the map units since it's, we're going to have to find out the degree of separation. So D to E is 6 um, and let's see, let's just double check it. So if D to E is six, then A to D should be 23. And sure enough, over here, A to D is 23. So that, that works out perfectly. All right, now let's see what is closest to D. 
and it looks like C is our answer for this one because it's eight. So we'll put C right here. Eight. Um, and by that same token, A to C must be 29 minus 14, so 15. Um, and sure enough, A to C is over here with 15. So that, that checks out perfectly. All right, so let's see what's closest to C. Oh, actually, we only have one thing left, so it's B. So we'll put B right here, and let's just make sure everything works out. So A to B is 4, and B to C is 11. So if you add everything up at the top, that does add out to be 23. So that works out, or sorry, adds up to be 29, so that's perfect. Um, and now we're just looking for B to D right here. So that's 11 plus 8, which equals 19, and that is our answer. All right, so let's work on number one now um, and the short answer. So in Snapdragons, red flowers are incompletely dominant to white. A plant breeder has a collection of red, pink, and white Snapdragons that she or he can cross to make seeds for growing next year's plants. If she or he wants to make as many pink flowered plants for next year as possible, what phenotype plants should she or he cross? So um, because it's incompletely dominant, we know that big A, big A is red, um, big A, little A is pink, and little A, little A is white. Um, and pink is what we wanna, we wanna get as many pink as possible. So there are a total of six possible crosses we can do. We can do red, parent and uh, another red parent. We can do a red parent and a pink parent. We can do a red parent and a white parent. We can also do a pink parent and another pink parent or a pink parent and a white parent or we could do two white parents. Um, but right off the bat we can cross out uh, two red parents because you only get red offspring um, and we can cross out two white parents because we'll only get white offspring. And if you do all of the crosses or even just think through it, you'll find that this combination is actually the best because all of your offspring will be big A, little A, which is pink. Um, but this question is just asking for the phenotype, so we don't need to write that genotype. So parent one's phenotype would be red and parent two's would be white. And that would get you um, as many pink flowered plants as possible. Okay, so number three, plant height in a dip diploid variety of sunflowers is influenced by five different genes, A through E, that contribute equally to plant height. Each copy of a dominant allele adds five centimeters to the height of the plant. Plants homozygous recessive for all five genes are 110 centimeters tall. So we know that the smallest plant will be 110 centimeters tall. Um, but how tall would we expect a homozygous dominant plant to be? So a homozygous dominant plant would have the following genotype, D, D, E, E. So each dominant allele adds five centimeters. So let's just count how many dominant alleles we have. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's 10 times five plus 110 and we get 160 centimeters for the tallest plant. Moving on to B, how many different heights are possible for this variety of sunflowers? So we know that the base is 110, so that's combination one, but we have 10 different um, alleles over here. Each of them can contribute five centimeters. So one plus 10 is equal to 11 different um, heights possible for this variety of sunflowers. And lastly, C, you cross two plants heterozygous for all five genes and produce 1,000 seeds. If you grow these seeds, what will be the most common height of the resulting plants? So uh, let's just do a cross for a heterozygote uh, with another heterozygote. So we'll just do um, capital T, lowercase t, capital T, lowercase t. And the most common outcome when you do this cross is um, a heterozygote, again. So it's a 50% chance you'll get 
um, a heterozygote, and then a 25% for each um, homozygous. So because traits exist on a bell curve, you are most likely going to get a plant that has this genotype if you do this cross. So the most common height would be 110 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times 5, which is 25. So 110 plus 25, which gets you 135 centimeters. All right, so six, you perform a test cross with a diploid individual heterozygous for two genes and observe the offspring listed below. What are the genotypes of the parental gametes produced by this individual? So a good rule of thumb is that the um, percentage of offspring with like the lowest percentage, so right here, 70%, 14%, those are always the recombination gametes. So um, we know that the because we're doing a test cross, we're crossing... Um, this, which is the parent, with this. So the little a and the big little b always comes from that test cross. So with the 17%, this comes from the test cross. Um, and with the 14%, this also comes from the test cross. So these gametes are recombination gametes. Those are not the parental gametes. Meanwhile, over here, 34%, a, b comes from the parent, and that's um, a parental gamete. And over here, lowercase a, big B, is another parental gamete. So the answer would be this. Okay, and last but not least, number eight. Someone is heterozygous for two genes that are located on the same chromosome as shown below. If recombination occurs between the two genes 24% of the time, what percentage of gametes would have the genotype A, B? So let's start off with, so if recombination happens 24% of the time, that means it's not happening 76% um, of the time. And when recombination doesn't happen, the gametes that you're going to get are AB or AB. And it's a 50% chance which one you get. So all you do is divide 76 by 2 and you get 38%. 